Thank you, everyone. I'd like to invite the panelists up to take a seat at the panelists' table. And as they're coming to the front, um, I would like to have the audience remember back to all their questions from the stimulating talks. Um, because there were so many questions, I um, would like to start with the audience questions. And um, we'll have web questions also. I believe Keegan will be uh, sending those forward. And please state your whole name and university affiliation or affiliation. Chris, Chris Bolpe, University of Florida. Well, I guess maybe I'm going to turn around a question that I think Rick sort of framed, which is, well, maybe we, how could we use this to probe um, the effects of inter individual variation on uh, response to toxicants? I guess we have some people who are some of the leaders in the field, and I'd be interested to get your, your thoughts on how could we use uh, this, this technology to probe this fundamental question that was alluded to by, by, by the speakers about um, the role of inter-individual variation um, in uh, response to toxicants. So I'll, I'll, I'll say, just from the genome editing perspective, um, technically speaking, taking your favorite 384 single nucleotide variants and then taking a panel of, you know, eight or 16 diverse genetic background lines and then knocking those variants on an otherwise isogenic background in homozygous and heterozygous state, that's technically trivial. That's a, that's a month of work. I think the so from, from the editing side, there is no obstacle to generating enormous panels of novel variants knocked in on isogenic backgrounds. Where it gets interesting, and unfortunately outside of my area of expertise, is how good are the sort of the disease in a dish models for specifically for the environmental health and toxicant. You know, you can make hepatocytes from um, iPSCs. Does the field think that hepatocytes in a dish are a good model for liver tox? That, that, that I can't speak to. But if you, if you wanted to pull down from many sequencing efforts a list of candidate variants, both coding and non-coding, and then knock them into Novo and get cells which ha have those variants isogenically, that's technically trivial. <laughs> okay, wrong button. I'm pushing the big green button. That's not a button. Um, Actually, I, that was one of the questions I was actually going to ask you. And uh, so one, one of the ideas and one of the big challenges in the genetics community is looking for modifier genes. You know, how do the sequence variations across the genome influence, say, a phenotype generated by a knockout of a gene? So you now, if this is trivial, uh, you have the potential to, to take that panel of, of embryonic stem cells that Ted has developed. And if you're interested in uh, cardiovascular disease, say heart arrhythmias, and actually Ted has developed some technologies to look at these beating cells and can in actually induce arrhythm arrhythmias in these different uh, cells from different genetic backgrounds. Can you go in and actually knock out a gene in all of those cells in different genetic backgrounds and look to see how genetic background can influence the effect, the primary effect of knocking out that one gene? And if you can do this in vitro, it, uh, this, the speed at which you can ultimately find the loci that are modifying is, is much enhanced. And then I think one of the big challenges that I, I tried to point out and, and I want to reiterate is that when you're mapping these loci, both humans, mice, and all species, you can usually get to within a genomic interval. And that genomic interval often has lots of SNPs and lots of different genes. And the challenge is figuring out which SNP and which gene is actually the effector gene that contributes to the phenotype uh, from that locus. So those are just a couple of different ideas that uh, I'm hoping that the genome editing folks 
So kind of doing, uh, I'll call it a Volpe experiment in reverse. <laughs> um, instead of looking, you know, modifying things around the genome on a uniform background, using the, the broad genetic uh, background differences in, in these embryonic stem cells or different lines uh, could be um, uh, the the human uh, the human uh, what's what are the human macrophage cell lines uh, I forgot um, but pardon me uh, well uh, different different cell lines um, the, of different genetic backgrounds um, but uh, so you know it's just it's just thoughts about how you could do that experiment so knock out a single gene looking for modifier effects uh, or using the the rapidity of the genome modifying tools to actually look at the genomic intervals and very quickly go in and do single nucleotide changes if necessary and look to see if you can actually um, ascertain which of those genes with sequence variants are actually causative. Just very briefly to, uh, to this important point about um, linkage disequilibrium and extended genomic regions being implicated. I think the editing community completely accepts this point. And I think we're finally there. Uh, you can both delete large haplotypes and you can introgress large haplotypes as well. Now, you're still back to the challenge that if you're, you know, if you've just deleted 100 KB with, you know, one SNP per, per um, uh, KB, you're still, uh, you still have 100 variants. But, you know, I, I know this is not intellectually elegant, but just purely technically, you get rid of a haplotype and you have a phenotype, then you introgress a haplotype from a different background and you have the same phenotype, so it must be one of those SNPs. Then at that point, flipping those SNPs to the other allele is a matter of a couple of undergraduates. In other words, it's not, it's no longer tech, it's not elegant, but it can be done. However, it can be done quickly, if that's what we're interested in. The other, the other, you raised the question about how good are these in vitro models. And uh, so suffice it to say that the, the National Toxicology Program and the Tox21 uh, program is, is very interested in in testing the robustness of these models. And I'm in just increasingly astonished at how much progress is being made uh, of making these models better. Um, I've recently learned about uh, the, some of the work of Mark Cotter at the University of Cambridge, uh, where he's developed some extremely robust tools to differentiate embryonic stem cells or iPS cells into homogeneous cultures of neurons. Or, or other cell types within the brain. Uh, I think this is a, a huge step forward. And, you know, they're, they're currently characterizing these. How, how similar are they uh, to, you know, neurons that you would actually dissect from a rat brain to do uh, these types of experiments? So I, I've, I've just been totally impressed at the, the progress at which these are being made. We may not be exactly there. In fact, some of the work is being done in our own national toxicology program. And uh, I've just been astonished at how, how rapid the progress is being made. So that's something you can, I would predict that it's in relatively short order that we're going to have pretty reliable in vitro models. I just had a follow-up question. Um, could the panelists discuss the challenges or benefits um, when approaching a complex disease that might have multiple um, etiologies genetically or combinations? Actually, I'll throw in some more complexity. So multiple etiologies, some being epigenetic, some of them genetic, um, and toss it all into the mix. So my colleagues, uh, how would you like to address that? So as, as we know, some specific chemical exposure, for example, um, benzene, see, not only cause maybe not only cause leukemia, could be, you know, <clears throat> cause other uh, cancers, um, you know, lymphoma or lung cancer. What? So that could be, you know, all hit on the different pathways. So I think using the genomic wide screening, you, you may not only focus on one pathway or one group of genes, actually, that would maybe allow us to, um, to find, you know, to, to have a more uh, mechanistic uh, evidence to show what the chemical exposure can cause multiple disease, you know, so multiple mechanisms. So that's what it is. And very briefly, it's a great question. I think, you know, the, the challenge of taking GWAS data and then 
doing something about the many SNPs that emerge, of which of course the overwhelming majority are non-coding, is a pervasive one in the field. Uh, one really strong glimmer of light that has recently emerged is the notion that you can take a GWAS study, take a bunch of hits that come out of it, and then using editing, attempt to understand the hierarchy of the underlying loci in, because it turns out that many naturally occurring alleles, which are typically SNPs, um, have relatively modest genetic effects, so they contribute only a small fraction of the overall heritability. But with editing, uh, as guided by GWAS data, you can actually make a stronger allele. In other words, you, you, you take a, a system where a, a given locus contributes 1% of the variability in the trait and edit, edit things in a way where suddenly you have, you know, 30% of the effect attributable to that. And so the, the reason this is useful is, is, you, is you go from a setting where the, the overall differences between genotype A and genotype B are in the, in the, in the, in the, in sort of, in the error bars to a system where you see really marked effects. Um, and that, that has the opportunity, that's, that's has sort of immediate, immediate translational implications because that, that really creates a functional hierarchy of the, of the, on the individual components of the system. But I don't want to misrepresent the situation. You, you, you touch on a problem that is, that is waiting to be completely solved. I mean, I'll just chime in here as well. And I think part of our challenge is really defining the, the, the dark genome or the dark matter in the genome. You know, the things we, we know that that heritability is there, but you know, there's no SNP showing up. So one of the challenges I would also throw out in, in using the Agouti model is that um, that's, that's about a regulatory element within repetitive sequences. So one of the questions that I pose to the group, and one that we're actually addressing in my own laboratory, is how often do the five million loci across the human and the mouse genome that have promoters and strong enhancers, how often do they actually influence the expression of the adjacent gene? But we don't really, most of us, uh, or most of you, we actually look at it, uh, don't really pay attention to that because one of the first things you do in an RNA-seq data set is you screen out the repetitive elements because, uh, number one, it makes it very difficult to analyze the data set if you don't. But secondly, it's, well, they don't do anything anyway, so why are we analyzing that? So I think that's actually part of the challenge. How often are epigenetic modifications or even genomic modifications and repetitive elements actually contributing to traits? And then the other thing I'll throw in relating to my fourth different general category in the landscape is what about the mitochondria? Uh, when we talk about, you know, the GWAS experiments and, and elegantly controlled experiments in mice, no one's talking about what is the mitochondrial genome and how is that cross-talking with what's happening in the nucleus. So we've got to start taking a more holistic approach because all of these variables will contribute to how an organism responds to the environment. And until we start taking this more holistic approach, it's going to be pretty much academic that we identify individual genes. We have to be able to pull together the genetics, the epigenetics, and the mitochondrial genetics and mitochondrial function to really look at how the environment impacts a cell and an organism. Thank you. We'll take an, an audience question. Uh, Gary Miller, Emory University. Um, so one of the great things about this technology is a lot of the, like, the tools from a construct level are readily accessible. But as we talk about creating panels of cell lines and different animal models, I guess we're thinking about how we make sure that those tools remain available. And what's nice about our panel, we have industry, government, and academic sectors that have that responsibility of making things available. And I just wanted to hear some comments about the relative roles of making sure that these tools remain available or allowed for reproducibility and things and how we go about doing that? Uh, so so we, we've thought a lot about this. And it, it has to go beyond just an individual, say, an R01-funded investigator to make resources available. Um, the NCATS and, you know, the former National Center for Research Resources yeah, paid a lot of attention to this. And one of the models is around the, the knockout mouse project. I mean, if you have now a knockout allele in every single gene, you know, how do you manage that resource? And, you know, the old model is that everyone generates a mutation and then, uh, you know, you're the newest technician in the lab, you know, gets charged with the, the job of finding the mice that have the mutation, sending it off, and 50% of the time it's the wrong mouse. But so it just, it's not a very good model. A better model is to recognize that there are these valuable resources and that the NIH uh, needs to be funding these resources and be thinking more 
holistically about you know, how do we provide these, provide the community with access. And uh, I think another model is not just providing the resource, but potentially having phenotyping capabilities. Uh, we have met metabolomic centers, which have a variety of different tools to, to do metabolomic studies. You know, why not have, if we're interested in screening, say, panels of embryonic stem cells, have a center that has all of the, the robotics technologies available to be able to maintain quality control on the, uh, on the embryonic stem cell lines, but can actually do some of the screening and potentially functioning as, say, a user facility, using, say, the national laboratory models, where you can have individuals write a grant, you get it funded, but you actually come into one of these national centers to actually do the screening, screening under the, the guidance of people who are skilled and really know how to maintain the resources. So I, we just, we need to have more discussions around those sorts of things. And, you know, as we continue to fine tune our strategic plan, you know, for the future, you know, all of you have an opportunity to weigh in. And if that's important, then weigh in. Does that answer your question? From the government side, I'd like to hear about from the industry and academic side about kind of the sharing of these tools. From academic, like, a, like in Berkeley, right, the IGI already create all the, you know, genomic wide scale um, library I mean, not only at Berkeley and uh, MIT as well and other um, universities, but I think uh, like what Rick said, now is uh, every, every institution or every research group, they, they create their own. But I, w I see what you come up, I think for more efficiently, let's say for the screening system, I, I'm sure maybe in few hours, <laughs> in few hours, no, in, in few years, uh, hopefully we would really or someone would take what uh, like IGI already um, generated the CRISPR I and the CRISPR A, mm -hmm. both in genomic wide or targeted approach, then maintain that in. But we do have to choose a more reliable cell line to make it this cell line is already made and is available for other researchers, so they don't have to start from the, the scratch. Then they can just say, okay, can order or just a book. So for now at Berkeley, um, IGI has been very, very, you know, if you need it, it's just uh, gave it to you. You pay a little bit of money, but it was very, very, you know, minimal. So I think that's a good way to go. You, you raise a really important point because, you know, bench, benchmark plasmid is trivial, but what does, what does it mean to have a benchmark cell? I'll give two examples that I think are sort of a preview of what we will see more and more of. You know, the, the old question of how do you eat an elephant? Well, one bite at a time. So the, the, the Allen Institute, no, not the original one, the new one, uh, my neighbors in Seattle, have started to engineer and releasing into essentially the public domain panels of lines. They have a focus on cell biology and morphology of organelles. Panels of lines that are genome edited to be able to uh, visualize specific organelles because they have sub-organelle specific markers integrated. And uh, a number of CROs, I think probably Sigma, Aldrich, um, and Thermo are the two best examples, uh, will sell off-the-shelf lines that they have quality controlled uh, for sort of genotype, karyotype, et cetera. I mean, the, the real question is, do we do it, and this touches a bit on what Rick was saying earlier about resource availability. If you look at the yeast people, they have done just an extraordinary job. Um, but the, the issue is they're working with a, with a war organism which has 4,000 non-essential genes. Uh, yeah, and so we're working with an organism that has just a few more. And the genetic structure is a lot more complex. So I think my personal perspective is that this is going to be a sort of how to eat an elephant one bite at a time approach, unless, you know, the, the awesome majesty of the federal government steps in like it has done with such large scale projects, you know, and code comes to mind and says, you know what? We're just going to do what only the federal government can do and enable a larger scale resource. Thank you. Um, do you want to say thanks. something or can, oh, can I oh. continue on? So, so I, I just want to reinforce, I think there is a role for the federal government, for the NIH in particular, and actually different institutes of the NIH working in concert with each other. So we're not coming up all with our own protocols. But I know that Francis uh, Collins is reaching out to industry 
and and you know, many years ago there was a very successful effort called the the SNP project. You know, back before we could sequence genomes, but it was uh, it was an effort to actually get you know major pharmaceutical companies all contributing to create a, a fundamental resource, which is then made available to the the broad based biomedical research community. So the comments that I made about res resources, I think, can apply to not just government-sponsored resources, but resources in academic labs, uh, as well as uh, resources that are made available through through different companies. I know Ted Choi at, um, at Predictive Biology, I mean, he's got to make money um, with, with the, some of the cell lines that he has working with pharmas, but he also wants to distribute these to academic labs. And so how do you do that? And I think as a funding agency, we have to just be aware of the fact that this costs money to do good quality control. And, uh, but that's going to be really important if the community is going to use these resources. We've got to make sure that someone, for example, is counting the chromosomes on these different cell lines. Um, yeah, what's the genetic background in the HeLa cells that you're using for one experiment versus another experiment? Cells are not just a test tube of molecular biology. They're actually a, you know, an organism. <laughs> And the outcome of your experiment in a cell line can be influenced by the number of chromosomes or the aneuploidy or things that many people may not control for. Thank you. We're going to take a question from Lisa. Hi, Lisa Elward from Summit Toxicology. Um, I, I have one that I think is a quick question, and maybe it's not. Maybe that just betrays my ignorance. And another one. Um, that maybe is something that we may want to discuss again over the course of the next day and a half. But the first question that I think is quick is, Rick raised the question about the mitochondrial DNA, and I don't know that I've heard in our presentations this morning whether or not these genome editing technologies can be targeted to mitochondrial DNA the same way we tar target the nuclear DNA. And so that's the first question. Um, the second question, which is a broader question, I think, is, um, I'd like to hear some thinking or, or discussion about how we might integrate the capabilities presented by these tools with our framework, our TOX21 framework that we've been developing with, with respect to adverse outcome pathways, and particularly with the possibility of looking at interactions among chemicals on, in influencing either the same step in an adverse outcome pathway or multiple or different steps in an adverse outcome pathway to affect a, 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 a phenotypical change. So I, I'd be interested in thoughts about the use of these tools to interrogate those sorts of issues. I'll do the mitochondria one. So to the best of my knowledge, um, one of the few uh, um, chinks in Cas9's brilliant armor is the mitochondrion because getting it inside the organelle requires an import pathway for nucleic acids. And I'm looking at the editors in the room. Uh, Vikram, do you know if anyone has gotten Cas9 into the mitochondrion? I mean, I know, uh, there are studies where people have published things where they, they claim to have gotten things into the mitochondrion. My understanding is that it's extremely difficult and not necessarily very reproducible, but I, but I could be wrong about that. But isn't it also about not just getting the Cas9, but you've got to have the guide RNA to, to a specific region of the, of the, yeah. of the genome. So that, that makes it uh, especially challenging. Yep. And actually might point more to some of the, um, the zinc finger approaches yep. where in your case it's just a matter of if you can target it to a specific region of the mitochondrial genome, it's yep. just a matter of putting on a mitochondrial lo localization yep. signal and getting it into the mitochondria. Yeah. No, Rick is exactly right. Um, so Carlos Moraes, for example, and others over the years have done exactly the experiment Rick is describing, which is target uh, protein-only nuclease systems such as zinc fingers or tiles to the mitochondrion, and you can see a very nice reduction of heteroplasmy. In other words, you can design them to be um, SNP-specific such that you selectively eliminate uh, the mutant versus the wild-type mitochondrial genome. So my angle has largely been that of clinical translation, and there, of course, the question is, well, how do you deliver this? Um, good luck to us all with that. But um, I th certainly in the d sort of disease in a dish or talks in a dish setting, are there tools today to create uh, pools of cells with different levels of heteroplasmy for specific disease-causing mitochondrial mutations? Absolutely. Exactly as Rick says. Actually, you may want to define heteroplasmy for this group um, oh, since I, it's, it's, I don't know, it, my <laughs> prediction is that many of you probably don't know what that is. Sorry. <laughs> um, 
So the, 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 the human mitochondrion in, in, is, is encodes a relatively small number of genes that depending on who's counting, I think it's either 12 or 13. Um, but furthermore, an individual, so the mitochondria in a human cell are thought to sort of form one large metamitochondrion, inside of which there float multiple copies of the genome. And in contrast to the nuclear genome, where there is only one, two copies, one from mom, one from dad, and there's a beautiful 50-50 ratio, um, the, just the biology of mitochondrial DNA is such that you can have mutant genomes and wild-type genomes present at different ratios. And that's called heteroplasmy. And so the, the goal of, for example, addressing a, a, a muscular dystrophy that is due to a mutation in the mitochondrion is not to eliminate all copies of the mutant genome, but just reduce the fraction of the overall genome load that is mutant. In other words, reduce the heteroplasmy. Thanks, Rick. I appreciate it. And, and multiple types of mutations in multiple different genomes uh, within different cell types. So it's, it's complicated. And just to add to that, since the mitochondrion is a rather large thing, and if you have the heteroplasmy on top of that, actually just sequencing uh, the variants in the mitochondrion is actually very difficult because um, if, if they're linked in different ways, um, then, you, yeah, it becomes a phasing problem with that's not necessarily tractable to short read sequencing technologies. Uh, so that adds another layer of complication. But, but, but certainly, if, if you can start to do that, then uh, it definitely becomes an interesting thing. Actually, can you remind me uh, of more of the details of what, what the second question was? <laughs> So I, I was interested in, in thinking about application of these tools in investigations related to our adverse outcome pathway framework, which is kind of arising from our TOX21 sort of concept and high throughput toxicology, and, and, and in particular, whether we can, whether and if, whether and how we might be able to use these tools to look both at, at mixtures issues as well as, as better elucidation of those out adverse outcome pathways or testing hypothesized AOPs um, in, in, in how that can help us move down the line. And this is a br pretty broad question, and we may talk about it more tomorrow, but, um, but I'd like to introduce yeah. that, th that Actually, it's, it's a very broad question. You're bringing up multiple different uh, issues, and, and, and I hope that we will cover them over the course of the next day and a half. They're very important. Uh, I'll simply say that one of the motivations for doing the in vitro genetics using, you know, creating the embryonic stem cells from multiple different mice with genetic heterogeneity was actually to bring the whole concept of genetics to the TOX21 platform. So that's what, what TOX21 didn't have. It didn't have the power to actually do genetic experiments. And by creating these uh, embryonic stem cell lines from the, the these diverse mouse strains, you can now do genetics um, by looking for toxicity or toxicity in differentiated cell types uh, derived from these embryonic stem cells. Uh, and often people ask me, well, you know, why are you doing this in mice? You know, you have human iPS cells and human uh, embryonic stem cells with lots of genetic heterogeneity. Why do mice? And the answer is very simple, that you can take your in vitro toxicity observations using these different strains of, of embryonic stem cells and actually make the mouse. So you can then translate an in vitro toxicity to an in vivo setting prior to actually extrapolating that to humans. So does your in vitro toxicity actually hold up when you make an in vivo model? Uh, so that actually gets to the, the validation. So if we have these in vitro models, how well do they recapitulate what actually happens in the whole individual I think with some of these mouse embryonic stem cell lines, we have the ability to begin to address that. But I think most of the, most of the other parameters, you know, you know, trying to understand how we can use the TOX21 platform and cells and culture uh, to, to really begin to understand all of the different variables associated with biological responses to chemicals. Mixtures is a big one for us because it, it's almost... <laughs> It's almost so simplistic when we think about how we do these testing. We take one chemical in a defined environment and we look to see what's the effect on a cell. Whereas the reality is no one is exposed to one toxic, one toxic chemical. 
We're breathing in PM 2.5 on the way here behind the Greyhound bus. Uh, we just have to be more realistic about developing these mixture-based um, uh, protocols for, for testing complicated interactions. And some of the, there's an investigator at the EPA who's done some work on toxic metals and you know, just taking three different metals and, and, um, and exposing cells at different concentrations of these three different metals actually evokes different biological responses. So, uh, so the TOX21 platform gives us some of the high throughput capabilities to begin to, to look at these things but we have to get more sophisticated. And that's part of our, as part of our strategic plan is really promoting the idea of developing more innovative tools to address this. And just to add, I, I think I want to separate the, the sort of platform with different panels of cells versus platform where you have the cells plus the screening technology. As a tool developer, I can say that you know, what we have now available to us, you know, we're mainly talking about knockout screens and activation screens and inhibition screens. We haven't really touched, you know, histone modification. We haven't touched nuclear architecture, um, chromatin looping, things of that nature. But these things are inevitably going to become uh, very facile in the next five to ten years. And so when we're talking about developing platforms in which you can uh, uh, that are available to uh, a broad range of researchers, uh, tool agnostic platforms that are m more, you know, cell lines that, uh, that have phenotypic variability uh, or, or genetic variability, I think are going to be more important than uh, platforms that already incorporate certain libraries. I mean, expanding this further, too, is there's a great interest at the National Toxicology Program of, of looking not just at, you know, phenotypes of the cells, but then taking the materials from the cells and doing expression profiling. You know, having the ability to now do a, a pretty reasonable profile even from a single cell. You know, this, is, this is now a reality. And you know, the challenge for us is to figure out how do we incorporate that into you know, these screening protocols to give us the type of information on how genes are behaving. And in, inherent in this is also looking at epigenetic parameters. Because the, the major driver for a phenotype that we're seeing Maybe, for example, something that's hitting the mitochondria, which is changing mitochondrial metabolites, which change then the level of, say, methylation, you know, mitochondrial metabolite-mediated methylation of the genome. And, and that's what's driving changes in gene expression. So we've got to be looking at these epigenetic marks. And then having, I think with genome editing tools, having robust ways to quickly go in and modify these to actually test, was this mark actually responsible for the phenotype, the toxicity phenotype that we were seeing. We're going to pause here and take some more questions. Great. Uh, this is Chen Lu from Harvard School of Public Health. I have two questions. The first one, actually, I already asked uh, in the field uh, in, during the break. So it's about uh, the base editors, uh, you know, which uh, can edit the genome without you know, generating the double strand uh, in DNA break. So I want to share your, your thoughts on how these new tools would sort of uh, add to or change the dynamic of the current tools. So the second question is more about the, the capability of this uh, you know, genome editing tool to not only just knock out a gene, but uh, to really fine tune the gene in expression. For example, if I want gene expression to be at 25% uh, you know, higher or 25% lower, because the reason I think it's important because as you know, in the in the uh, complex human diseases, we don't have a you know a, you know total knockout of one gene. In fact, uh, you know most of the the, the gene variants they, they regulate gene expression. But the problem is that there are so many of them in one locus, in hundreds of SNPs, and you could go there do you know uh, gene editing each one of them. But the other thing you could do because most of them actually associate gene expression, the total effect is like the Increase gene expression by 1.24, 1. You know, you know, you know, 0.7. So I, I guess that, you know, w what's the current, uh, um, you know, our ability to to fine tune this to like you know very small amount of uh, changes. Yeah. So I'll say with the base editors, I think the exciting thing about uh, base editors uh, is that. You know, we're not talking about knockout anymore. So, so there is a, a nicking step. Uh, and so you can get indels uh, 
in your base. So if you do, you know, if you were to do a base editor screen, for instance, you know, you might see some indels, but you know, we're now talking about a realm where you can make very focused changes and uh, David Liu is kind of working on expanding the, the toolbox, that, and I, I believe that eventually, you know, you'll be able to make any single nucleotide change. Uh, so now when you're talking about genes that, you know, might be haploinsufficient um, or, you know, the complex genetic modifications, uh, individual uh, variation where you have single nucleotide variation, but kind of getting to the second part of your question as well, where you want to... Uh, test multiple uh, different variant, uh, the effect of, you know, a single variant, double variant, triple variant uh, at a time, when you're going in with sort of a more precise tool um, that's change of function rather than loss of function, uh, I, I think that will have a huge impact. Um, there's still a lot of technological progress that needs to be made, so um, there are kind of two flavors of base editors, one that... Uh, that modifies C and one that modifies A, but you know there's still there's still some technological um, uh, work to be done there. Thank you for asking, Chen. I'll, I'll take the second question about uh, tuning levels of gene function rather than going for all or now not effects. First, I, I really want to second your point that these sort of all or not or all or nine none effects, such as with a knockout, um, I mean they certainly exist, but they're, for example. Some of you can drink milk, whole milk, some of you can't. And that's sort of an all or none regulatory effect on whether lactase is expressed in your, um, in your in intestinal epithelium. So there are two, two, but there are many settings in which there's a much finer level um, effect on whether a, what a gene does. And this also touches on Shruti's points about complex traits. So two technologies are, are out there for your use today in your studies. The first one I touched on briefly, I know that we'll, we're going to have some more about this later in the day. Um, a number of groups have, have used um, zinc fingers, TALs, and CRISPR to make um, basically designed transcription factors. And uh, you can deploy them in cells and, uh, in fact, in, 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 living cyst in, in living organisms. There was a very nice paper from the Belmonte lab um, in the mouse where you can, using um, adeno-associated virus, deliver such a transcription factor to a tissue, such as the musculature, um, and basically tune a gene up or down. So this tool exists today. So you can get that RIA stat-like. Now, if you, if you don't want to do that, the other approach, which is somewhat more recent but also works quite nicely, is it turns out that regulatory DNA, promoters, enhancers, and the like, are actually quite editable as well. And I think the, the poster child for this is the erythroid enhancer of BCL11A, which at this point three separate biotechs are taking to the clinic for sickle cell disease. Um, it's basically a regulatory region that flips on a gene in a specific lineage. And it turns out that when you edit it, you gen one of the great things about editing um, is, and I haven't really shown very much of those data, but others I'm sure will, is when you do a single break, um, in the end joining pathway, you get, get a nice spectrum of insertions and deletions. And it turns out, of direct relevance to Chan's question, each different allele is associated with a different level of expression. So this is sort of kill multiple birds, birds with one stone experiment where you take a, a gene, you cut its promoter or enhancer, you sort out the resulting cells. Some cells have larger mutations, other cells have smaller mutations. And it turns out that concomitant with that, you have a beautiful grayscale seri allelic series um, of expression levels. And that, so in one experiment, you get this beautiful panel that go that takes you from zero all the way to 100. It's a great question. Actually, I just want to expand. Uh, part of the challenge goes beyond just looking at levels of expression of, of the protein. But I've, I'm just increasingly astonished at the, de the different degrees of alternative splicing that happens within genes. And, you know, we're, we're in so many ways, it's so naive. You know, we create a knockout of the gene. But we're, we're not paying attention to the fact that, you know, the, you know, so many different isoforms are expressed from that gene. And so I'm, I'm really hoping the, the promise of gene editing is going to allow us to go in and selectively eliminate certain splice forms. Because it, it's in many instances, those splice forms give rise to different proteins. And they may be expressed in different cell types. So it's, just, it's astonishing how, how you know, kind of naive we've been relative to even the simple approaches, you know, knocking out a gene. 
Well, we're interested in what's the function of that isoform of the gene in that cell type, say, within a section of the brain. So we've got to be more sophisticated. And you're creating an allelic series should include not just changing the coding sequences and changing the level or you know, hypomorph or, or, or um, uh, hypermorph alleles, but changing the isoforms. Thank you. Hi, Gary Ginsburg, Connecticut DPH. And uh, it feels a bit like we're all children in a candy shop where the candy is getting less and less expensive, and so we have more, more and more choices of what we might want to spend our time doing. Uh, but from a public health perspective, um, and thinking about what is a press, one of the pressing issues, of course, um, uh, things like liver cancer going up, and we don't have good explanations other than the fact that there's metabolic disorder, probably some uh, lipid accumulation things going on in the liver besides um, viral hepatitis. But you know, having uh, an animal model system where we've got yellow obesity um, system uh, where maybe now we can start looking at how chemicals are affecting the epigenetics of that system, I mean, should we be spending our time in the candy store looking at animal models of human, where we can manipulate the animal model and look for the epigenetics or the genetics of that condition more specifically with these tools and then try and then go into epidemiology rather than starting with GWAS and looking for these you know, correlations with, with weak penetrance of genes. So is it better to be starting from the animal model of human disease, given all the questions about that, or you know, what's the best way to, you know, to use these tools to understand human disease and chemical interaction with disease process? I mean, my, my, my personal feeling is that uh, there, there's a whole group of people in biomedical and environmental health sciences that basically is coming from the point of view that humans are what we're studying and we should be studying humans, period, the end. And I just have fundamentally a problem. Um, so you're doing epidemiological studies and, and you're studying now peripheral blood lymphocytes and looking for epigenetic patterns that may be actually inherent in, say, some undefined cell types in the brain uh, that may be actually causing autism. So, so instead of this whole notion, let's just wipe out, let's get, let's get away from animal models, let's ask the question, can we actually make the animal models better? Sure. And, and actually, the first thing we ought to be doing is getting away from this notion that I introduced, that if you're going to do an animal model, use an inbred strain. And, and Jackson Laboratory sells 4 million C57 black 6J mice every year. And that's because anyone who does a, quote, mouse experiment that wants to model human disease uses an inbred strain that everyone else uses. But we all, we have to keep in mind that these inbred strains are designed for experimental rigor and reproducibility. They don't model the genetic uh, heterogeneity that exists within the human population. So we got to remember that. So all the human geneticists who would, would never do an experiment with one human uh, actually will go in and use one inbred strain of mouse, and, and if that doesn't recapitulate the result that they see in humans, is, well, the mouse doesn't work. Well, does the mouse not work, or is there truly a species-specific difference in the biology between the mouse and the human? So I think we have to evaluate these things. Um, in fact, even if there is a true species-specific difference between the mouse and the human, that actually might be very interesting to evaluate. It'll help you to understand something unique about human biology. So I guess the, the very succinct answer to your question is that I think you need to do both, um, but let's not you know, just completely uh, get rid of the, the animal models because they're, quote, not humans. Let's think about how can we make them better. And I think using the collaborative cross and the diversity outcross, I could have showed experiments how using the diversity outcross actually recapitulates what you see in humans. Using a single inbred strain of mouse doesn't for benzene toxicity. So think about how we can make it better. And then if you have the animal models, um, you can do so much more with an animal model, especially with uh, epigenetics research. You can go in looking at uh, different cell types. You can mark them with different uh, you know, GFP markers. And so the, the, the details that you can describe are, are so much greater than you can with human population. 
Um, but eventually you'd like to be able to link up to the experiments that are being done in humans. So it's really a question of both. You want to have your foot in both camps. You want to be at the intersection of human and animal model uh, genetics, epigenetics, and biology. Thank you. I have a follow-up question to that maybe for um, Lu Ping, but for the complex disorders um, that you were mentioning where there might be not an initial initiator or cell defect or one pathway, how would you go about building a model that maybe in the hypothalamus there's an issue specific to the brain, in the pituitary there's another defect, and maybe in the gonads there's a third defect? Okay, before I ask the Try to answer your question. I just try to add one more thing for uh, um, the last. Um, I think, I think beside the animal models, I want to add the in vitro screening. It's also a more efficient and uh, first maybe first step. I just think more economic way. I mean, anything involving human studies is just going to be take a long time and the big expense. And so if we have. Uh, better knowledge from the in vitro screening and move to the animal model. And then we gen generate a much more close, you know, specific hypothesis. Then testing in the human seems is more um, good, you know, better approach. Um, back to your question, it sounds like you're asking how could we using the in vitro screening or the, uh, apply the CRISPR in, um, let's say, the brain. Multiple tissues, let's multiple say, tissues. at the same time. Mm -hmm. Oh, multiple tissues. But I, I, I know, so this uh, government from UCSF, they actually did, they are now applying both the CRISPR I and the A for the neurodegenerative <laughs> disease. So, um, you know, using specific the cell, cell types. But you are asking multiple. Um, we 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 can pull the uh, the different the genes. Can we pull the different cell type in one? That that's actually maybe a question for Phil. Sure. I yeah. mean, I, Shruti, if I, I, if I understand the question correctly, if the goal is to ask whether there are sub, anatomically substructure specific effects of specific alleles, so I think, and the, the field of neurodegenerative disease has done a substantial amount of work on this. I mean, you can stereotactically deliver editing agents or epigenome editing agents. Um, I, I had the good fortune of having worked on some of this for Huntington's, you know, if you, for example, if you want to look at the basal ganglia versus some of the other regions, you can certainly deliver a specific genetic or epigenomic outcome in the mouse, the rat, in non -human, and in non-human primates. And through both a combination of a viral serotype, or if you're using non-viral delivery, exactly how the stereotaxis is done, you can confine the effects of whatever edit or epi-edit you are imposing on the organ to a specific subregion. Now, I imagine, I have no background in anatomy, but I would imagine that this would be organ-to-organ -organ variable. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, perhaps with the heart or um, a smooth musculature, that th 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 things, things would be dif different. But certainly in the brain, if the goal is to ask, here are the, 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 the five substructures and let us, let us create the same allele and look at them separately, that, that can be done in the mouse, can be done in the rat, and while expensive, it can be done in the non-human primate. Thank you. We'll take another question. Actually, can I, can oh. I just uh, add, so I, I assume okay. that you could you know, target the Cas9 or your uh, zinc finger proteins to specific cell types. Uh, using using cell type promoters, so you're actually expressing the the gene knockout only in specific cell types using the good old fashioned uh, conditional gene expression tools. So that's that's an it's another way that you yeah. can do that. Yeah, Norb Kaminsky, Michigan State University. Uh, my question uh, pertains getting us back a little bit more to the basic science around uh, gene editing, and and the the session is called trends, techniques, and capabilities, and I'm. I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about what are still the major technical obstacles or challenges facing facing this area. Because, you know, from from the presentations that we saw this morning, uh, we touched a little bit about specificity, 
But other than that, for somebody that really isn't using this currently, this technology, I kind of get the sense that, that we're, we're already there. Is that true? And I'm, I'm not talking about application. It's clearly delivery for medical purposes. Uh, that, that's a whole nother ball game. But in terms of just kind of the technical aspects around genome editing, have, have we pretty much have everything we need now? Um, so I guess I'll take that in two directions. One, the, the non-primary DNA sequence modifications, where we're, we're talking about the epigenetic modifications, we're talking about nuclear architecture, chromatin, chromatin looping, that's still, you know, that's still an evolving field and that's very much something that needs to be worked on and, um, you know, more progress has to be made. Um, just taking cleavage, you know, I talked about specificity. Um, what I believe we're still lacking is the ability to target uh, a single nucleotide variant. So Cas9 has been made specific um, on a genome level, but if you want to, if you have a SNP and you want to only cut the, the SNP modify, the SNP and not the wild type, uh, that's a little bit more of a challenge. Now, there are ways with PAM variants where you can target certain alleles versus not, but, um, you know, I've had a lot, I've had friends come to me, they want to make very specific heterozygous mutations that recapitulate uh, a patient they've seen in the clinic who has a certain interesting phenotype. Um, and in some cases that's easy with cleavage and knock-in, but in some cases that's harder. And if you don't have a way to select for heterozygotes and your, your phenotype, then that becomes a little bit more difficult. So I think the, the precise make any single nucleotide change in the genome is still a challenge. And that, that's kind of where base editors are a little bit more, ex, you know, provide some excitement. I, I second everything Vikram has said. And thank you, by the way, for, for it. It's always fun to think about uh, what else is there to do. So I think in brief, folks, everyone in the room, uh, Plain vanilla gene knockout, in, if, you're, if you can grow your cells in a dish, then a plain vanilla gene knockout is as simple as PCR. I'm not exaggerating. This, this is a complete off-the-shelf order and all ago, go, done. If you want to make a point mutation, you need to work out how to deliver the repair template, which is, and you need to be able to cut close to the site of the mutation, as Vikram alludes to. Um, this is another feature of Cas9 that People are working on super actively, and, and uh, Keith Chang's lab that uh, Vikram did some of his work in is, is one of the, the ones that has succeeded to try to get Cas9 to be more versatile and less restricted. Uh, but the good news is um, there are other nucleus classes, zinc fingers and tau effectors. They don't have that restriction, and they work quite well. Um, I think if, if, if one takes a step back and sort of what would I like to see five years from now um, in, in, in the field of gene editing? Um, I think absolutely um, being able to uh, deliver the um, editing machinery to um, multiple tissues on demand and get efficient genomic outcomes in, in, in both rodent and non-human primates would be really transformative, I think. Um, so in other words, you, you will realize, you realize I have just switched from a genome editing problem to a delivery problem. <laughs> so I sort of pointed, pointed at a different field. Um, the, the, the break, the, initi the editing initiated break as at this point, not, an, not a limitation. So that, that one we have solved. And I think to specificity, I, I'm really glad Vikram gave his presentation, which sort of gave a very nice overview of where that field is. Um, nucleases vary in specificity, but at the end of the day, it is not the bottleneck. You can get a guide or a zinc finger or a towel that is sufficiently specific to get you your, the cell of interest. That, that, that is not what's currently stopping us, I think. I think getting the, the editing machinery into more interesting cell types, especially in living systems, is, 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 the, is the big challenge for the next five years. Thank you. Actually, can I ask a question about efficiency across different genes? So you say that, yes, you can go in, you can hit it up, you can make a mutation. That's, that's pretty, pretty straightforward. But say that you're doing some of the experiments that, uh, where you're looking across the entire genome. Are you hitting all genes with equal efficiency? Okay, and so that's one of the challenges. So, uh, and just, just to be aware of it. So you may, for example, may be trying to hit a part of a gene to inactivate a splice form that may be refractory to hitting. 
So that has to be part of the, the SOPs. All, Rick makes an important point. All nucleases exhibit variable on target activity. Uh, many people are trying to understand why. There is not a uniform answer. So the approach is a largely heuristic one, which is literally trial and error. The beauty of Cas9 is tr trying 48 guides is n trivial. <laughs> um, so what people have historically done is use some al initial al algorithms to pre-compute best looking guides and then just throw them in. But the problem Rick alludes to is a really interesting one, and it is this. Imagine you want to cleave precisely at the splice acceptor of exon 4 of your favorite gene. You build a, the best guides, they don't work. You build the best zinc fingers, they don't work. And the question is why? And I completely agree that this is something that the field needs to understand. Does it correlate with expression? It, in, in the quiescent cells, it does. So, you know, a possibility is to preactivate the gene briefly, do the edit, then go let the gene go back down. People have tried these kinds of experiments. I think we have question for one, uh, time for one more question. So We can go until noon. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> go ahead. Okay, David Taylor, UT Austin. Uh, two questions. One was about the liver-specific delivery. Uh, so zinc finger nucleases are, are able to do it. So are the CRISPR RNP? So RNP means ribonucleoproteins. And so that would seem to me one avenue. I know the Donna Lab has worked on that um, for possible delivery to mitochondria. So this, the, the liver is an incredibly attractive organ for gene editing, um, for, for clinical efforts, and for um, certainly questions of inter organism interacting with the environment. Um, viral delivery works quite well. Adeno-associated virus is, is the virus of choice. And the reason it's important is there's a clinically, there's an approved gene therapy um, uh, from Spark Therapeutics. It's not for the liver. There are, there are multiple others in the wings. So um, the, the clinical trial that Sangamo has, is doing uh, involves using a virus to deliver zinc fingers to deliver to drive editing. You're absolutely right. Uh, Jennifer's lab, Jennifer Downer's lab, has done a very nice work on non-viral delivery, as has Dan Anderson's lab. Um, in this, I think I, I should say that in this regard, the, the editing community is really benefiting from the precedent that is set by the RNAi field. Um, you know, alnylam is in phase three and is a, probably on the threshold of approval after 20 years of trying super hard. And everything they've learned about how to formulate nucleic acids for in vivo delivery um, has really has really helped. But to, to just to take a step back and make a more general point, what is the single most editable organ in the, in, the, in the mammalian organism? It's absolutely the liver. I mean, hematopoiesis first, but that you can edit ex vivo. But in vivo, it's the liver. Uh, one last question. Actually, so can, I, can I ask a follow-up on the liver, so staying on that, on that topic? So I'm not a liver biologist, but the little that I know is that uh, hepatocytes are pretty heterogeneous. And in fact, as they, you know, they migrate toward the limiting, uh, the portal vein, they actually change their ploidy. And uh, so it's a very complicated system. So in, in terms of targeting liver cells, wouldn't it, be to go, it get to be a lot more complicated if you're actually increasing you know, copy number? And, and how uniform do you actually target? Uh, or are you targeting specific, um, say, the, the, maybe the stem cells within the, the liver? So I don't know, what about comments? So, so the question is how homogeneous is your targeting when you're looking at a very heter genetically heterogeneous um, cell system? So there's just not enough good data in the field to say. Most what, what people have done with great success with all nuclease platforms is get serum readouts of on-target engagement. So you know there's beautiful work from Feng Zhang on PCSK9, the work from Sangamon, on the albumin locus. So what, what gets physically done? You, you inject the virus with the nuclease, you wait, and then you um, look at serum chemistry. And lo and behold, you see a massive upregulation in the gene you've knocked in, or a massive downregulation of, of the gene you've tried to knock out. Now then, the, the, the important point that Rick is raising, which is the liver is both heterogeneous from a cell type perspective, and even within a given cell type, it's karyotypically heterogeneous ploidy-wise. That, that, of course, requires harvesting the organ and then doing a sophisticated juxtaposition of sort of tissue histology with measurements of on-target activity. And there's a lot less data of that type in the field. Uh, so one, two last follow-up questions. So one, uh, you talked about uh, specificity being enough, but if we wanted to increase specificity, so I know that the Zhang, Young, and Downer Labs both use um, 
sort of uh, methods to, when they're increasing specificity, they're just looking at, for instance, structures and things of that nature to make site-directed mutants, but are there ways that we could use, for instance, evolution, or are we just gonna, in vitro evolution, or just will we look at uh, what nature has already done in terms of the cast proteins? And then lastly, um, can we do something with the CRISPR RNPs that target it to specific um, cells by adding on a signal peptide or something like that? Is that, is that something that's possible? Yeah, so to address the first question, I can't reveal all my tricks, but, <laughs> um, <laughs> but you know, protein engineering is just one part of it. And uh, to some extent, the, the mutations that have been described are, are very low hanging. Um, these haven't been like the, the most extremely detailed studies. Uh, I can say in my case with HF1, you know, I looked at the crystal structure and I pulled together four alanine substitutions and it worked and that's what I took forward. Um, part of, I think, the reason why you don't see, you know, the data just published, uh, you know, a paper on an improved variant, but it's not necessarily, it's pretty much similar to what's already out there. Um, we just don't have the techniques to actually go past the floor to figure out, you know, how you even define what improved specificity over what we already have is, and so that's part of it. Um, the other thing is I focus in my talk on uh, protein modifications, but there are a whole host of other ways to improve specificity. Um, there are guide RNA modifications, uh, you know, the timing of exposure of cells to Cas9. You can imagine if... If, if you're delivering Cas9 protein and it doesn't last in the cells as long, you're going to have fewer off targets than if you, uh, if you deliver DNA or, or RNA. Um, you can do various things to activate Cas9 only in certain windows. Um, so that's, that plays a role in that those are kind of active ways to improve specificity. Um, the other thing, and Fyodor has brought up zinc fingers and talons, uh, a little bit as well. If, if you are talking about specificity, you don't have to be limited to Cas9. Um, uh, talons are actually extremely specific, uh, and you can make talons to, to recognize not 20 base pair target sites, but much longer than that. Um, there are some issues with recombination, but those are, uh, those are you know, workable. But you know, zinc fingers can also be very specific. So the various platforms, um, when you're talking about specificity, it doesn't have to be Cas9 focused, and Cas9 isn't necessarily the answer. Um, so if you know, if we're talking about th human therapeutics, then I think all options are on the table, and you just basically have to maximally design your system for your specific gene target and find, you know, through evolution and whatever approaches you get, the the max, the best solution for that particular target, and it might not be the same protein or platform as it would be for a different target. So just quickly, we have a comment from the web. I want to make sure we get in before the end. Um, it's a comment and a plea. So the first comment was part of was in response to much earlier in the conversation that besides isoforms, the genes also contribute to pieces of RNA in the cellular environment. And the second is the plea to consider more than just our typical model organisms when we're talking about genome editing tools and exploring them in research. There's a whole host of organisms on the earth which these tools may be useful for and we should expand research to those too. I can briefly speak to the second one. One of the true, true, deeply gratifying things about the history of this field is the way it has lowered the barrier to entry into a new organism of interest. You know, when I trained in grad school at Brown in the early 90s, we had yeast, fruit fly, a zebrafish, worm Arabidopsis, Drosophila. And within every single taxonomic group that these organisms represent, there are now literally dozens of new species that have been brought online and people are working with them uh, through the juxtaposition of two things. It is trivial to sequence the genome of your favorite critter, your, your new worm or beloved fly, and bringing online genome engineering in that critter is relatively straightforward. I mean, random example, the, the monarch butterfly. Who would have thought the monarch butterfly would be a, a model system? Um, it's, its genome has been sequenced, it is quite editable, and we now understand some aspect of the molecular mechanism that helps it do its marvelous migration from Canada to Mexico. 
And the same is true for the people edit naked, people edit creatures that we never thought people would seriously work with because you have neither the genome sequence nor the ability to understand what the individual genes do. That's now completely changed. Actually, I just want to reiterate that point, and I'm glad that the, this person brought it up. Um, the, I think one of the true powers of these genome editing tools is the ability to actually go into a broad assortment of organisms. I mean, for example, Daphnia, which is a, an organism that's used pretty extensively in the environment. Um, you know, homologous recombination and the standard ways of modifying the genome aren't going to work. So just reiterating that um, the, 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 I think one of the powers of these genome editing tools is you can, you can take it to a broad assortment of different organisms that are used for an environmental health science. And it's not just rats and mice. So that's very, a very important point to make. Actually, while I've got the microphone on, can I ask just a quick question? What about level of expression of the, uh, of the, the Cas9 and or talons? Uh, has, has there been a very careful evaluation? What's the optimal level of expression to actually hit your target? Um, is just more, more the better, or do you want to control that? Yeah, I, I think you basically want to control your exp I mean, it, 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 you want to control your expression so that you're getting the desired level of, uh, of modification at, at your target allele and uh, just that because certainly the uh, specificity will be in influenced by how much you're expressing uh, and how long. So uh, that is an important parameter. We'll take uh, two more questions. Melissa Perry, George Washington University. What I want to thank so much, the panel, my uh, learning curve has been an absolute vertical line to, uh, this morning. Um, I wanted to ask the panel to think about uh, the near future, and I mentioned in the beginning and in the introduction of this um, uh, committee, our efforts in seeing what's not already there. And we're learning a lot about the mechanics and also the mechanisms, which is highly uh, informative. And I wanted to ask about the data structure issues. Are we talking about um, qualitative description of expression, or are we talking about a multivariable, multi-factor potential high throughput issue in the very near future? I heard th high throughput, I heard sensitivity, specificity, and also heard threshold, and I think about all of those in a quantitative way. So might we be here in three years talking about data tools for managing uh, massive amounts of uh, gene-edited data? Uh, I, I think certainly, and, I, and actually, I'm glad you brought that up because it's a really important point. And uh, one of my colleagues has met at Mass General, Luca Pinello, has thought about this a little bit. There's so much data from functional screens out there, right? And and I think everybody, you know, there are repositories, and you can put your data out there. But if you're talking about, you know, anybody in the audience right now wanting to go back and call up a certain CRISPR screen data set and do their own analysis, that's not very straightforward. I mean, this, this applies not only to genome editing data, but all high throughput sequencing data. Um, but it's going to be critically important, I think, as people do all sorts of screens and, you know, whatever your model cell lines or whatever your exposure are, just to be able to see what other people have done. And I think it's kind of up to the funding agencies on, on a broader level or, you know, bigger organizations to try to come up with a set a platform where you, you know, a shared data platform of some sort. I think that would be extremely important. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, David Sherrod, Boston University. Uh, quick question, almost a yes or no. Um, is there any evidence that the Cas9 in these cells is immunogenic? I mean, I mean, so I, I know there's a, a preprint on BioArchive that that suggests that um, you know it's something that people have theoretically said quite a bit. I, I don't know more. I don't know more than that. I, I'll throw out that as you make different variants and different combinations of Cas9, you know, connected to different other functional proteins, that that potential is always out there. I don't know if Fyodor has more detailed information. So. In a, in a clinical trial setting, this, this is something, because in vivo editing has only just started. So for ex vivo, the nuclease washes out before you put the cells back in. For in vivo, this is something that they're obviously looking at, looking at right now. 
Um, the one thing I will say, that there, there's been a really elegant way to preempt this issue in, in mice at least, and I'm sure people are making the rat as we speak, or it's maybe being made. There's of course a Cas9 mouse. So there is a mouse that expresses Cas9 constitutively. So, you know, it, it is recognized as a self-antigen from birth. So the way you do editing in that system, or epigenome editing, is you deliver virally or non-virally, you just deliver the guide, which of course is a tiny snippet of RNA and the cell doesn't care. So at least in model organisms where you can do uh, transgenesis, um, that's been addressed this way. It gets interesting when you go into non-human primates, which I'm sure is a topic of interest for many of you in the audience. I am, and this might be just my ignorance of the literature, I am unaware of an example in the published literature where people have delivered plain vanilla Cas9 and then looked for neutralizing antibodies. Those studies might be in progress. I suspect the, the biotech, there are a number of biotechs that are putting um, editing by Cas9 into the clinic. There's um, Editus and Intellia and CRISPR. They all have in vivo efforts. I imagine that they find your question very interesting. Yeah, uh, unfortunately they might, but it seems to me, of course I want, I want, I think I want to know, I know what the answer I want to be is that so with so many people putting strep Cas9 into cells and then putting the cells in animals, you would have seen something by now. You would have seen those cells go away or immune responses that completely obliterated the initial specific biologic response you were looking for. But then that's absence of proof, so. Thank you so much. Thank you to the panelists for a very stimulating discussion and morning. Thanks. <laughs>